Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Chris Chinook here, Executive Director of the 8K Association. Uh, my guest today, Scott Huggins, Director of Business Development at Evans and Sutherland. Uh, we are going to talk about their incredible uh, Dome X uh, LED uh, system. Uh, and we're going to get into that in just a few minutes. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background on, on the, this Dome X technology to, to start with, however. Uh, so, um, first of all, this is the I think the first completed and operational LED-based dome theater uh, in the world. Is that, is that correct, uh, Scott? That is, Chris, thanks. Um, we actually had a very crude demonstration facility uh, set up in China with a partner of ours who helped us develop the uh, LED panel technology, but it was literally mounted uh, between two old buildings in China where uh, visitors had to crawl through literally a window that used to be an exterior window of a building. So demonstrations were not practical, and that's why we've built what we call an experience center, which is a, a demo facility that's meant for visitors and has a, a functioning 8K LED dome. Yeah, it's it's on paper looks amazing. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, it's 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 a 20 meter dome. It has 29.5 million uh, LEDs with a horizontal pixel resolution of 8192. Uh, that's essentially 8K. Uh, and that's spread over 180 by 112.5 degree field of view. That's big field of view, obviously. 7970 LED panels covering 4,700 square feet of LED surface area. And uh, these LED tiles are actually perforated, so you can get sound through them. They're essentially transparent. Uh, so very novel technology. Um, so uh, on paper, sounds great. Uh, Scott, I know you're very enthusiastic about it. Um, now, in fact, um, you gave a presentation at a recent uh, uh, industry trade show for the Giant Screen Cinema Association. That's right. Um, and we're going to run that that video now uh, because it provides uh, a very nice overview of what this system is and some of the capabilities. And then we'll come back here and talk a little bit more deeply. So Great. let's turn on the video. Hello, everyone. Greetings, GSCA. I'm Scott Huggins, Director of Business Development for Evans & Sutherland. We're very grateful for this opportunity to share advances in immersive innovation, Domex, and the content possibilities of giant screen dome display. I'd like to share very special thanks with Tammy Barrett, Michael Doubt, Christian Fry, and everyone on the Innovations Committee. It's a very, very unique time for the giant screen industry. And at Evans and Sutherland, we feel it's an equally unique time to invest in giant screens and to push visual fidelity like never before. Why do we feel this way? because we passionately support giant screen cinema. We wanna deliver inspiration, transformative technology that exceeds audience expectation. For ENS, a central and critical goal is recapturing the magic that astonished your audiences in the days when 1570 film was the most powerful, moving visual experience audiences could have. Our investment in the future of dome technology is the reason I'm joining you from this one of a kind location the COSM Experience Center, site of the world's first Domex LED dome. Our investment here is key to our support of your future as giant screen cinema professionals. Over years of Domex development, we've carefully considered every parameter, engineering for the best display that's possible in a dome. Until now, all dome displays consisted of a projection system element and a reflective screen surface. The quality of the display is dependent on the projector's quality and to a large extent the screen quality as well. Let's start with a little background and compare how conventional projection onto a dome compares to an LED display. When we're trying to get the greatest number of pixels onto a dome, choices are actually limited. Design theaters around a single projector with limited resolution or use multiple projectors. While it's very possible to achieve ultra-high resolution with a multi-projector system, there are key reasons to embrace an LED-based solution. One of the most critical of these factors is system contrast. 
If you think about it, projecting on domes automatically reduces the possibility of high contrast visuals. Light on any part of the dome reflects back into the space, illuminating the other imagery projected. The result, as we've all seen, is that washed out look where video is lit up by unwanted reflected light from other parts of the scene. This cross-reflection issue is compounded by the fact that high brightness video projectors can't achieve perfect black levels. Some gray background light is always present, even in higher contrast systems. And with multi-projector systems, there are also issues with color and brightness consistency from projector to projector. This can be addressed with blending software effectively, but with an LED screen, the uniformity will be guaranteed. Brightness is also challenging. There's a limit to how bright a single projector can be. So for brighter imagery, we need to add more projectors. On top of these quality and uniformity issues from projectors in our domes, there are also sightline limitations, particularly if we want to project close to the floor. Even the physical domes themselves create image problems as they age and collect dirt over time. The Domex LED display addresses all these problems by design, starting with resolution. The 20 meter Domex dome behind me in the Cosm Experience Center has a horizontal resolution of 8192 pixels. The field of view of this demonstration dome is 180 degrees in the horizontal and 112.5 degrees in the vertical. The configuration in the Experience Center is one of the ways we're beginning to think of theaters outside the conventions of standard layouts of giant screen domes. Theater configurations are flexible and can be customized to facilities' needs. Since the projector sight lines are no longer a limitation, hypospheres are possible where the surface extends all the way to the floor. Our Domex demonstration dome is made up of 29.5 million LEDs over 4,700 square feet of surface. And there are 7,970 individual panels making up the display here. The panels themselves are black with a non-reflective finish, so cross-reflection issues are eliminated. There's no light scatter to wash out images on the dome. When LED pixels aren't addressed, when they're off in other words, there's no residual illumination creating ambient gray levels. The result is an unprecedented contrast, black in the imagery that appears completely dark. What we've begun to think of as cosm black in the experience center, creating a depth and presence to the visuals that can't be achieved with projectors. The brightness of a Domex LED dome is an astonishing 150 foot Lamberts. In many cases, we'll operate the demonstration dome at a fraction of this brightness. Even at 5% maximum power, we're brighter than almost any projection display on a dome this size. The frame rate of Domex is 120 frames per second. Real-time content can be shown at that full 120 FPS. Stereoscopic 3D is also displayed at 60 frames per eye, allowing for 60 frames per second playback and real-time rendering. One very important design factor for Domex is the transparency of the panels. The panels of Spitz's giant screen projection domes are perforated, creating a screen surface that allows audio to pass through. Domex panels are also perforated, so speakers can be mounted in the ideal position behind the dome, giving a sound that originates directly from the image, not below or to the side of the screen. The panels themselves are attached to the frame magnetically, 
so they're easily removed for service if necessary. A key design consideration for the best possible dome is its structure, a supporting frame that ensures the panels are accurately registered to one another and will maintain proper registration over the lifetime of the dome. Without the right frame, this precise pixel distribution wouldn't be possible. Dome X's structural frame is designed, manufactured, and installed by Spitz, the world leader in dome screens. The structure consists of a steel frame that ensures the rigidity of the whole dome, with an aluminum inner frame supporting steel panels for the magnetic attachment of the LED modules. Extremely fine adjustments can be made to the panels as they're being mounted at installation. While the frame, LED modules, and electronics total almost 50,000 pounds, Spitz's structure ensures the panel placement is accurate to four one-thousandths of an inch over the 4,700 square feet of the dome surface. Now that we've taken a deep dive into the technical parameters of a Domex system, let's talk about content and how ENS sees digital display impacting your giant screen presentations. While Evans & Sutherland continues to invest and develop LED domes as future technology for immersive cinema, we're actively considering the impact of digital display for your institutions. Key to this thinking is how giant screen theaters deliver relevance and value to your guests. As operators of giant screen cinema theaters, nothing is more important than your content. Ultimately, it's your identity, and it's what you rely on to keep your audiences coming back. In today's immersive digital theater spaces, there's almost no limit to the content possibilities. There are new emerging opportunities to make your programs more immediate, more local, more diverse, and most important, more relevant to visitors. Our theaters are entering a digital content era where new alternative uses create opportunities for customization and renewed relevance. A core capability of the Domex system is the real-time rendering engine. Domex systems incorporate Evans & Sutherland's ESX data simulation platform, capable of rendering the universe and natural phenomenon in spectacular detail. ENS pioneered real-time computer simulation, and we invented the world's first digital planetariums, so science visualization is in our DNA. Theaters need their content platform to be powerful, but also intuitive and easy to learn, so visuals are immediate and right at the operator's fingertips. Theaters can simulate the natural world at the microscopic or macroscopic level. In addition to astronomy and space science, Theaters can develop interactive presentations for earth and climate science, biology and life sciences, chemistry, engineering, physics, and more. This creates opportunities to augment the film schedule with live lectures and science-based programs. Popular and widely used software platforms create interactive simulation capabilities that are constantly changing the way theaters approach real-time visualization. With engines like Unity and Unreal, we can immerse audiences in almost any environment imaginable. ENS operators have the tools and the power to create unique programs, multimedia presentations, data visualizations, immersive art, and lessons on a wide range of subjects. Hundreds of ENS theaters worldwide regularly upload programs to the cloud, so thousands of presentations are available for download at the push of a button. Live presentation capability also lets theaters develop custom multimedia for special programs. Operators have access to intuitive tools for sponsor recognition, personalized messages for audiences, live lectures, gala events, virtual performances, and any presentations where special content is needed. In the digital theater, presenters access streaming video from the web and display 360 live action footage easily. As ENS considers the future of digital dome display, we're planning for creative new ways to use the dome and to enable artistic visualization in immersive spaces. The art and performance possibilities are almost limitless. Imagine your theater as a space for virtual art installations, music visualization, live performance under the dome, 
wellness and meditation sessions, and creative shared spaces where cutting edge visualization takes place regularly. ENS is excited and inspired by the alternative possibilities in dome theaters. We're also passionate about the future success of your institutions. We hope this brief glimpse of Domex and the Cosm Experience Center inspires you too. We genuinely wish we'd had the opportunity to see everyone face to face this year, but we invite you to visit us in Salt Lake City when your travel plans allow it. We've invested years into Domex and the Experience Center with your facility in mind. Thanks again, everyone, for giving us the opportunity to share our vision for the future of giant screen cinema. Okay, uh, we are back. I hope you enjoyed that video. I was very impressed, I know. <laughs> uh, so first of all, uh, Scott, let's, let's talk about um, the organization. Um, you're with Evans & Sutherland. Uh, Evans & Sutherland uh, acquired Spitz uh, some years ago, which was basically a technology developer. Uh, and now my understanding is that you have uh, another corporate uh, entity owning both Evans & Sutherland now. Uh, COSM, C-O-S-M. So tell me a little bit about, about the history of this and the focus of these organizations. Yeah, and I actually began with Spitz Incorporated. We're a planetarium company that was founded in 1947. And Spitz is known worldwide now as the largest uh, manufacturer of domes in the world. We make virtually every dome screen that the public might be aware of in planetariums, in giant screen theaters and also in theme parks as well. And we were acquired by Evans & Sutherland in 2006. Evans & Sutherland is essentially the inventor of computer graphics. Uh, the first uh, graphic input devices were developed by Evans & Sutherland. They were the first to have CGI in a Hollywood movie. Uh, and they were most importantly for this business, the inventor of the digital planetarium. They invented the first computer-based planetarium in 1982, the Digistar, and now are the most popular providers of video-based digital planetariums in the world. And that technology now involves not only the dome screen and digital projection onto domes, but real-time rendering that's capable of doing data simulation, uh, visualizing the universe at the macro scale, visualizing the microverse at a very small scale, and then, of course, there is a, a complete video playback, immersive video capability built into that that allows us to uh, project and display giant screen cinema content onto domes, science content onto domes. So our primary market with Evans and Sutherland is planetariums and giant screen theaters. And then part three of that story is the fact that we were acquired by COSM uh, a little over a year ago and COSM is developing immersive technology uh, based around experiences in virtually every other venue and application you can think of. So uh, immersive experiences for uh, artistic presentation, for performances, for live streaming, for sports streaming, for music entertainment. So COSM is sort of the, the part of our organization that's bigger and even more far reaching than our planetarium and giant screen cinema focus. Right. Okay. Okay. So actually that's almost part of a trend we're starting to see now. So uh, you've got the uh, Illuminarium is another group that's doing these kind of experience centers. Uh, those happen to be projection based. You've got MSG, uh, the Madison Square Garden group that's doing these sphere uh, concepts. Um, I believe it's confirmed now for, for Las Vegas and, and London, maybe New York. Um, so there's, is there, a, is there a theme here? Yeah. Um, in fact, I, I feel like we're seeing a new uh, immersive uh, attraction or experience opening just about every day. And um, we are very interested in where uh, immersive experiences are going, but we're coming at it kind of from the group experience standpoint. Um, you know, we're aware of what can be accomplished with VR and with gaming and with real-time engines. 
And we're looking for ways to make larger scale immersive spaces relevant to audiences in different venues. So we're interested in what the possibilities are for immersive galleries in natural history museums. Can uh, the entire entryway of a museum uh, turn into a curved immersive space? Uh, we're looking at partnerships with art galleries where art is displayed on grand scales. Uh, we're looking at uh, live lecture halls or live performance halls where rather than it being just a static stage or a flat screen, we can surround entire audiences with a virtual theater. Mm -hmm. So we're involved in immersion and experiences in, in any place where large groups might gather and where we can transform a space from a, a flat rectilinear experience into a more spatial spherical experience. So in, in the cinema space, um, you know, we've, they, we've been talking about alternative content to get into theaters, traditional theaters, you know, like corporate events and, and, and um, live performances and arts, some of the things you've been talking about, um, but it hasn't really taken off. So I'm maybe adding this immersive uh, element here, the, 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 the 3D-ness of the dome, is that maybe the missing ingredient here to make this happen? Yeah, and there's a little background there too. You know, there's been an interesting push-pull between the, the goals of an immersive theater like a giant screen cinema venue and the producers, right? If, you, uh, if your bread and butter is running IMAX films six times a day, then uh, standards and a regular format are exactly what you want, right? You want every film to come to you uh, with the same formatting. You want to be able to run that film through your projector or run it digitally and have the same experience for the audience every time. You want it to be reproducible. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at museums and giant screen cinema in particular in terms of different use cases. Um, because we started uh, in domes as a planetarium company, then real-time simulation has always been our bread and butter. Uh, we're able to render the universe in real time. We're able to move from planet to planet or galaxy to galaxy or molecule to molecule. Uh, we're able to three-dimensionally render the human body or the terrain of the earth. And so we, we live in a digital universe that's literally a real-time digital universe. So what that does is open up all these possibilities for giant screen cinema to make content that's much more unique and localized and relevant to their facility. If their focus is natural history, then uh, there are rendering engines that allow them to render out a photorealistic 3D jungle or a desert or the surface of Mars. But there are also multimedia capabilities that allow museums to recognize their sponsors better, do custom events, gala events, birthday parties, live performances. And so that's where we see uh, giant screen going in particular is the ability to not only run the can presentations and the great movies that are being produced, but also to make unique content that's going to be relevant to their visitors and that they can change on the fly. Yeah. Uh, you can accept content from standard game engines, I presume. Unity yeah, both Unreal. Unity and Unreal are supported. And in particular, we're doing a lot of experiments with environments and modeling and Unreal. And it's incredible what we can do. It sort of democratizes the digital real-time space because not only uh, can we take information and content that's already created from other producers, but with a little bit of training, the operators of the theater or the students in a university can develop their own environments and simulations too. Yeah, and you've, you've, I'm sure with the Evans and Sutherland um, graphics processing, you've got the horsepower to run all of the all the physics at the at the top levels to do ray tracing to do high fidelity images that can be, I suspect, almost film quality in real time. Yeah, yeah, photorealism is not a problem anymore. You know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if we'd been having this conversation, the dialogue would be very much about how do we get things to look real? And the beauty is, you know, the hardware seems to keep up with the requirement, right? Uh, as we keep pushing the realism and creating better lighting, better texturing, better organic realism overall, um, the you know GPU acceleration and the ability 
to really do things in hardware gets better and better too. So uh, we're reaching the point where it's almost impossible to tell the difference between simulation and reality in a dome. Have, have you considered uh, esports as a uh, business opportunity here? Yeah, it's, you know, everything is on the table and, you know, we definitely see sports and esports as a, a direction that will really be supported by these immersive venues. Okay. So let's, let's turn to the, uh, to the video world now as well. Um, so obviously you can have potentially have a uh, live content, a uh, um, sports facility, uh, a live game. It could be, you know, the Super Bowl, for example, might be interesting in real time. Uh, a live concert, uh, it could be performance art, uh, opera, um, it could all be live. Uh, and then you could also have uh, recorded content. Uh, so tell us about the cape. Let's, let's maybe start with live. Uh, what are the opportunities and how, do, how can, what's the mechanics of making that happen? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, right now, one of the, the things that we're testing out in our experience center where our dome is in Salt Lake City uh, is just broadcasting live events uh, wherever possible. So let's, let's talk about uh, uh, flat content. Suppose you have, uh, you know, 8K uh, 16 by 9 or 4K 16 by 9. How do you, how do you put that onto the dome so it looks good? Yeah, this is another area where our origins as a real-time planetarium company affect the way we treat rectilinear content. Um, unlike, uh, you know, a monitor or a flat screen display, when we demonstrate uh, rectilinear content, say we're trying to put 4K on the dome, uh, our rendering engine actually first maps that video onto what you can think of as a three-dimensional texture. We can make that video a plane that's floating in three-dimensional space and then resize that window and actually warp that window in three dimensions so that if we want a 4K by 2160 flat screen video to cover 60%, 90%, 100% of the screen, that's really a matter of manipulating it as a 3D texture. So in some cases, we'll take that texture and spread it all the way to the edge of the dome. Obviously, if things were either rendered uh, as uh, fisheye uh, projection, or if they were captured with fisheye, that will map very naturally to the dome. But we have the ability to keystone and change the shape of those videos to take up whatever amount of the screen we want. So it's not necessarily a question of how does flat video map to the whole dome. It's a matter of how does the operator of the theater want the geometry of that image to look. Sometimes it's really in your face. Sometimes we take up a smaller amount of the screen. Uh, and sometimes we can billboard things that they so that they look like a perfectly flat window sort of floating in space. So it's actually bespoke to the operator what they want to see in a video. I see. Okay. And I would suspect uh, 8K resolution will be preferred to 4K because you don't have to do upscaling. You've got more flexibility in how you map that. Yeah, definitely 8K is the way to go. And there are so many producers now creating content in 8K, not only in flat screen, but also, you know, there are companies that are taking uh, 360 by 360 capture with custom camera rigs. And again, using the warping technology that we can do in 3D, what we can sometimes do is take a 360 degree image that's been mapped around an entire sphere, but take a slice of that image and actually unwrap it again and map it to say half a dome so that we're taking advantage of full 8K on the dome. Wow. And yes, we are using upscaling. It's an AI upscaler and it's surprising how effective a 4K can look when it's upscaled to 8K. Obviously, the original pixels, the, the quality of the original uh, footage matters, but it's surprising how effective AI upscaling is getting. Okay, okay. So you're really not that concerned really about the, the, the format that comes in because you've got so much flexibility to manipulate that image, it sounds like. No, in fact, um, there's an interesting uh, quality about the dome that we've installed at our headquarters in Salt Lake City Rather than it being a hemispheric dome that's mounted overhead where the audience is looking up, we've turned that dome 90 degrees and mounted it so that you're looking into a dome that's horizontal. 
and the dome is truncated a bit at the bottom, so the floor cuts across the bottom of that dome. The result is that rather than looking up awkwardly into images that are at the zenith of our vision, we're looking straight ahead at the eye line. And the experience that gives you is that you're really looking at a very natural scene. If we bring in sports footage, for example, um, we're looking directly at the footage where the athletes are in front of us, the geometry of the field is sort of below our eye line, and it all looks very natural. So in some cases, this is even just conventional rectilinear footage that we're showing on a portion of the dome that looks really immersive and really effective. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the dome technology itself. Um, so traditionally, domes have been for either a single projector or multiple uh, projectors that have to be blended. Uh, in your presentation, you talked a lot about some of the deficiencies of, of, of this, uh, the crosstalk, the, the blending, the black levels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the LED screens, for the most part, uh, eliminate all those issues. Um, they're obviously more expensive. So why why did you pull the trigger now? Well, that depends on how you define now, actually, because we've been in development of an LED dome for almost 10 years now. Really? And it's been a, a gradual and iterative process as panel technology improves, as the pitch improves, uh, we're able to get a, a better and more seamless image on the dome. And frankly, we reached the point where we could continue to invest in projection, in more expensive projectors, in brighter projectors, in higher contrast projectors, or we could essentially reinvent the wheel and eliminate all of those projection problems, the problems related to contrast, the problems related to blending, uh, the issues of having to support multiple projectors. And on a more subtle level too, the, the dome itself can be a problem too. A brand new dome installation can be pristine and perfect with absolutely no dust or dirt or irregularities on the dome, but as domes age, they take away from the image quality. Today, with the uh, LED technology, because the dome is the technology, we're, we're not even bringing age in as a factor. The panels are uniform, the image is uniform, and we're getting around all of the contrast, reflection, yeah. uniformity, and even dome irregularity issues that come with projection. Yeah. Well, I've, I've certainly seen in the theatrical space, Samsung has their Onyx uh, LED screen, which looks looks amazing. Uh, in, the, in the traditional theatrical, there's also the Dolby Cinema uh, solutions that are out there, the projection base, but all of them are kind of driving toward higher luminance levels and, and lower black levels. Um, so I think you spec the brightness on your screen is uh, about five, 500 nits or so. Um, I think the Onyx screen is typically, contents master typically around 300 nits, but it can go to 500. Dolby Vision is around 110 or so. Um, but of course, you've got this great black level, um, which potentially allows you to do a, 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 some kind of dynamic range. So I don't, I don't think um, the traditional high dynamic range has come to the, the domed theater space yet. But I imagine with this technology, you've got the opportunity to do this. So what's your thinking there? Yeah, we're definitely interested in HDR. Uh, it's just not quite there yet for domes, but there's certainly an effort to do it. So when, when we are able to announce, you know, very high dynamic range for a dome, we will definitely let everybody know. You'll be the first to know. <laughs> the capability is there, but uh, you need to put some 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 pieces together. Okay, exactly, exactly. Okay, three D three D is supported also in your in your in your dome. Uh, how do you do that? Yeah, it's you know as you can imagine with really high frame rates, we're able to do uh, both real time and playback at at 120 fps we're able to alternate uh, pixels uh, at 60 frames a second. So we use mechanical shutter glasses, dynamic glasses that actually uh, shutter uh, separate frames per eye so that you're seeing a true 60 frames in right eye and 60 frames in left eye. So rather than having the issues of polarity or color, we're actually mechanically turning off every other pixel per eye and then displaying one frame view per eye 
and another frame for eye. So each eye gets real 3D at 60 frames a second. Oh, that's great. Active shutter glasses then, yeah. Correct, yeah. Okay. So have, have you measured the, the, either the stereo contrast or the traditional contrast of your, of your screen yet? Yeah, we have, and um, you know there are a couple of things that really uh, punch the contrast in the format. You know, I should say for background, because dome contrast is such a challenge. Uh, the reason, as your audience might know, is that when you display any kind of bright imagery onto the surface of a dome, some of that imagery is getting reflected back into the space, right? The dome doesn't absorb the light, it reflects the light back to the eye. So that light is also being reflected onto other parts of the dome. So our typical test for uh, dome contrast is to put up a simple black and white checkerboard, uh, use a light meter to measure the output on the black and then measure the output on the white. And the problem is that the contrast reading that you get is affected by the light that's bouncing off of other parts of the screen. So what's happening when we're measuring uh, contrast on an LED dome is all of that secondary light, all of that light that would reflect back onto the imagery is eliminated for a couple of reasons. First of all, the panels themselves are a flat black material. We've started calling it Cosm Black because it's uh, not only a dark surface, but it's also a matte surface that doesn't allow any light to reflect. And then when LEDs are in the off state, they're for all intents and purposes, perfectly off, right? They're black. So that when we're measuring the difference between a black space and a white space, I wouldn't call it an infinite contrast ratio. That would be uh, arrogant of us to say, but it's almost immeasurable. You're talking about in the millions to one contrast ratio between black space and white space. And I would guess uh, a, a good projection contrast ratio with the checkerboard is probably in the tens to one, maybe a hundred. In domes, we're lucky if we can say, you know, it's 10 to one, 20 to one or so. Yeah. And all of that, that dome reflection problem just goes away with LED technology. Yeah. So that contrast has got to create um, um, a, almost a 3D like image, right? It's got to get more dimensionality. Yeah, in particular, the dome disappears, right? If you yeah. project anything white on a dome, you're aware that you're projecting on a white or near white space. And in the case of the Dome X dome, you really do feel like you're looking into infinity. And it's wonderful to be able to turn the lights off in a theater, have no graphics on the dome, and then actually just see black. You're not aware that the dome is in the space when you're, when you're looking at black video. Yeah, yeah, wow. Do, do you talk about uh, the pixel pitch that you're using? Yeah, the the number is a little misleading. We're uh, about 2.75, uh, 2.5 to 2.75 pixel pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason that the spacing is a little greater than you would expect in a high resolution display is that the panels themselves are perforated. We want yeah. uh, the dome itself to be neutral to audio. And as you mentioned in your introduction, we can mount speakers behind the dome and then have sound realistically projecting from the imagery because the panels are perforated. And it's also a little bit more forgiving to HVAC systems too. When airflow passes through the dome, uh, you don't have to design the space around you know, unusual airflow. You actually let the air pass through the dome. So we open up the pixel distribution a bit to allow the perforation. Uh, and then we find that eye point resolution is somewhere in the order of about two to three meters away from the dome. If you're standing back from the surface, uh, roughly eight to 10 feet, then the pixel point is pretty near eye point resolution. You no longer see those pixels. Right, okay. And uh, the, 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 the wider, the deeper pixel pitch, the, the longer pixel pitch would be maybe toward the, the higher parts of the dome or the pl places of the dome that are further away from the audience. Yeah, exactly. And typically in a dome application, you're not putting an audience right up against the screen. Yeah. The seating or the platform or the floor location uh, will usually be set back so that the audience can take in the full dome. Tell us about your uh, your business model. Uh, what, what do you want to sell? Who do you want to sell to? Boy, it's, uh, it's pretty wide open. Uh, as you know, our specialty is giant screen cinemas and planetariums. And of course, we're actively uh, promoting LED domes in those markets. 
but we're in conversations now with art museums, with uh, specialty museums like Natural History. We're talking to artists about doing uh, bespoke entertainment venues that are built around this dome technology. Uh, we're looking into experiences for large audiences that are uh, tailored specifically to live broadcasts. So venues where we might do uh, sporting events at one time, followed by performances at another time, followed by gaming at another time, followed by uh, artistic uh, exhibits at another time. Mm -hmm. So we're really asking the world to tell us where we're going as much as, as carving these out uh, to a specific shape for a venue. I think there is uh, an interesting revolution coming and an interesting opportunity for museums and facilities to reinvent themselves. It's been a long time since a uh, display medium came along like IMAX, where a facility was able to say, uh, get in your cars, drive to our venue. You're going to see something in display that you've never seen before. Yeah. And I think this may be the first time in decades where the museums uh, that host our planetariums and giant screen theaters can really announce something transformative. They can say to their audiences, if you visit, you're going to see something you've never seen before. And I think the future for museums, not to be cliche about it, seems very bright. Uh, the marketing opportunities, the opportunities for a museum to really reinvent their image and build a venue around something that audiences are going to get excited about and come to see uh, is out there. Uh, we feel like institutions are gonna have an opportunity to say, come in, visit us, see something that's going to change the way you think of display. Hmm. Well, that's a, hmm. well, that's a, that's a great point because um, you could certainly argue that the, the, the home TV market has gotten ahead of the theatrical market in terms of image quality. And, um, and we need, some, we need a, a, some, a draw to get us back out of the house. And maybe domes and LEDs are the draw we need. Yeah, and we don't think of it from the technology standpoint so much as the experience standpoint, right? Sure. Um, groups can come into enormous venues and be completely surrounded, completely immersed in the visuals, whether it be art or entertainment or a live stream. We're really putting audiences inside the image. And so it's an opportunity for, you know, especially in the post-COVID world, for people to begin to gather again and really have immersive, high-resolution, high-tech experiences as a community, as a group. There's a concept uh, that we're uh, describing as shared reality, where we want our audiences to have uh, the, the experience that's as impactful as a high-resolution VR experience, but with a group, where they experience it with their friends and with their colleagues. Yeah. Well, it certainly seems that the, uh, we, we no longer watch content. We have to experience content, don't we? <laughs> yeah, and experience is the magic word too. Yeah. And uh, it's really what's guide, guiding our partnerships, the collaborators that we're working with is how do we deliver something that's a new experience where the technology goes away, where um, the concern about 4K, 8K and future resolutions is overwhelmed by the fact that you're inside the image and you're saying, wow, as I look around this space, I'm seeing something and experiencing something I've never seen before. You know, we haven't talked about audio. Um, to tell us about the audio capabilities of the Domex. Yeah, you know, in such a vast space, uh, we're able to put a lot of speakers on that structure. And uh, I forget what we're up to, but I think, you know, we're, we're uh, in our experience center uh, demonstrating uh, something like 17.4 audio, you know, 17 speakers. Uh, with four critical, uh, you know, center speakers mounted. Um, and as audio formats improve, as we get more and more speakers, the dome just offers this great opportunity to really surround and envelop people in the speakers. So bring it on. If somebody's got the 30.8 sound system, we're ready to mount it on a dome. Well, NHK's um, uh, 8K standard is 22 channels. So it sounds like you should be able to transform that into your 17.4. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Awesome. Scott, it's been great. Uh, I can't wait to see this. Uh, hope this hope one's coming to me sometime soon. 
<laughs> We're looking forward to having you and uh, we hope you get a chance to see the LED dome as soon as possible. I would love that. Thanks again, Scott. Take care. Thanks, Chris.